This week, we're talking about Jesus. If you've been here for the past couple of weeks, we've been in a series talking about Jesus. Jesus is a good thing to talk about, right? The last couple of weeks, he's really been focusing on two aspects. Last week, he was talking about Jesus, the radical. How many of you guys have that radical friend, right? They're fun to be around. You never know what's going to happen, right? That's what Pastor talked about last week. The week before, he talked about the company that Jesus kept. If you've missed those, those messages, you can jump on our YouTube page and see all of those, plus a lot of others. But this week, I'm going to continue the series on. We're going to be talking about Jesus still. And the aspect that we're going to be talking about Jesus is Jesus is light. Here we say that. Jesus is light. So I want you to realize the title of my message today is this. You've been lied to. You've been lied to. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for today. God, I just thank you, Father, that you would help us to know more and learn more about you. Father, I pray for every person in this room. God, I thank you that our hearts are open to hear exactly what you have to say in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. I want you to think back to your childhood, and I want you to think back to what was one of the first fears that you ever faced. Or if you're a parent in this room, you probably know this even, even greater, what's one of the first fears that your children faced? Fear of the darkness, right? So if you guys know me, I've got three kids uh, with a fourth on the way. Wasn't expecting that, right? That's thank, thank you, Jesus. But we've got three kids, and most of the time, well, not most of the time, almost every night, we have developed this new routine where I sleep on the couch. And the reason why this has happened is because, you know, the kids start off, you know, pretty well in their rooms. And then what happens at like 2.30, 3 in the morning about three of them end up in our bed, right? Now, we've got a king-size bed. We've got a large bed, but not, our kids are now getting older. And they leave, I'm not kidding you, I will wake up at 2.30, 3, whatever, in the middle of the night, and I've got like this much space on that king-size bed that I am trying to sleep in, and I've never been so mad at my kids and, 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 and than I will get in the middle of the night. You know, I've tried to act like a bulldozer and push them over, and they just flop right back over. And so usually, I, you know, about a year ago, I would just, just go downstairs and sleep downstairs. And then I would get a peaceful sleep. They would get a peaceful sleep. Everything would be good. Now I just start off downstairs. It's just, it's just way easier. I don't have to get woken up. You know, they start in their rooms, but they just trickle in or whatever. And the whole thing revolves around what? Them being afraid of the dark, right? And what's interesting to me is, you know, when you're a kid, you're really usually pretty isolated to the chaos that's happening in the world, right? You don't really know about the murders in, this, in your cities. You don't really know about the political divide happening in your nation. You don't really know about the wars that are happening all over the world. But yet, for some reason, even though we're isolated from all of these things, we still have this fear of the dark that just almost naturally seems to happen, right? Why is that? What is it about the darkness that even though it's not like, you know, I, I remember whenever I was young, uh, I was, all, I was, I was, what, was I the one of the worst? The only one. I was the only one. I never knew that until right now. That's awesome. I was the only one. That's great. So, so there you go. Now, you know, I was the worst one when it came to being, I'm not anymore. Okay. Right now that's like, uh, let's just clear the air here. Okay. This wasn't part of my message. But Station and I, one of our biggest arguments is, do we leave the TV on? I love it and to be pitch black dark, so not anymore, right? But no, whenever, I remember whenever I was younger, my brother, uh, I would sneak into my brother's room and he had a waterbed. What happened to waterbeds? Like, why don't those come back? But he had a waterbed and under the waterbed, or like, there was like this little ledge thing and I could fit perfectly, I'm sure he knew I was there, but I, I you know, probably, I didn't want him to know that I was there or whatever. And I would like sneak real, why? Because I was afraid of the dark. And it wasn't like there was just something that happened in the darkness that, you know, there was just these realities in my mind that there was a monster under the bed or there was a burglar coming in or there was somebody in the closet. Where does that come from? There's usually for most kids, there's no context where it's like, well, one time there was a monster under my bed. So now I am afraid of the dark. It just happens, right? Well, here's what I want you to understand is You've been lied to when it comes to darkness. And obviously we're talking about Jesus, but to get to the point about understanding that Jesus is the light, you have to understand a few really important things about darkness. So I don't want you thinking I'm getting off track. Towards the end of the message, we're going to talk about Jesus, I promise. But you have to understand some things about darkness to understand the foundation of Jesus being the light. So if, when you jump into starting to learn the, 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 uh, learning how to study the Bible— 
one of the things that they'll first teach you is something called the law of first mention. Now, if you guys know me, I usually like to preach. Everybody always tells me to slow down. You're talking too fast. Today, I'm going to really try to teach a little bit, okay? So we're talking about the law of first mention. So when you're studying the Bible, they say this. Actually, I'm just going to read it so I don't mess it up. The law of first mention says this. To understand a particular word or doctrine, and today's word we're talking about is darkness, we must find the first place in Scripture that word or doctrine is revealed and study that passage. The reasoning is that the Bible's first mention of a concept is often the simplest and clearest presentation. Doctrines are usually more fully developed on that foundation. So to fully understand an important and complex concept, Bible students are advised to start with its first mention. I think it's really interesting that one of the first things that we face as, a, as a, one of the first fears that we all universally face is the fear of darkness. I want to show you something. What's the first book of the Bible? It's Genesis. Obviously, the first chapter is chapter 1, so that's where we're going to go. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, verse 1 through 3. This isn't just the first mention of this particular idea. This is the thing that the Bible opens up with. This is the first thing, even before there was sin and there was all of these, you know, bad things, even before humans were made, we talk about darkness. Look at what it says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters. And the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and then he separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness night. And evening passed and morning came, marking the first day. Think about this. The first problem God ever solved was darkness. Before even there was sin, the first thing that he corrected was this issue of darkness. That's the first thing that we face. It seems like that there's this whole really kind of idea of firsts being wrapped up in this issue of darkness. Now, for most of you guys in here, you know, obviously as I just uh, showed you, I'm not afraid of the dark anymore, okay? Most of us in here probably aren't afraid of the dark anymore. We could probably sit in a dark room and, and we're going to be okay. We're, we're not back to our childhood. But what I think happens as you grow up, it's not that you're not afraid of the dark anymore. It's the dark areas of your life shift. We go from being afraid of the literal dark to there's other dark areas where it's like, man, I didn't expect this in life. I didn't expect this to happen. Why is this going on? Why, do I, why is my heart dark? Why are my relationships getting dark? Why is... I had this planned, and now this feels dark. And, and, and for some of us, we never actually leave the darkness because we don't know how or where to turn the light on at. Darkness just shifts. And here's the thing about darkness, and this is where it goes back to the title of my message. Darkness, that, when it, think about back when you were a child. There wasn't really realities in there, right? There really weren't monsters under your bed. There wasn't something hiding in the closet, right? The only thing real about darkness is the realities that you create in your thinking. Because here's the deal. Darkness actually isn't real. I'm jumping ahead to my first point, but I just feel we're going to go ahead and go, go into it. I want you guys to hold out your hand, okay? Even the introverts in the room. I'm an introvert. I know this is weird. Just hold out your hand. Create darkness for me. Somebody in this room create darkness for me. <laughs> somebody you can't here's my point you've been lied to in this sense darkness is not real it's the absence of the presence of light you need to get that darkness is not real it's the absence of light you cannot create darkness to create darkness, you have to remove something from its presence. Even if we were to turn off all these lights, if we were to shut out all these windows and make sure that there was no shred of light that could get in here, how many of you guys have an iPhone that has the smallest LED that emits light? It would light this whole room up. Why? Because at the presence of light, darkness has to go. If there is light present, Darkness literally, scientifically, physically, and might I add spiritually, has to leave. In no way can it stay. I didn't mean to rhyme, but there you go. <laughs> There's no, there, there is no sense at all in which darkness can just stick around. 
So think about that. If you're facing a dark area in your life, what does it look like to bring the light in? Because you've been lied to all of your life, thinking that this darkness, how many of you guys know, when you're going through a dark time in your life, like it feels so isolating. It feels like, you know, there could be a, obviously we could all be in this room. If all the lights go out and we shut the windows, we don't even, we could even be in a position where we don't even know each other is in the same room. I remember whenever I was, uh, you guys all know Pastor Joe, is he still here? He's not, he was, he was my youth pastor. And um, I remember whenever I first really felt called to ministry, I was like, I had no idea what that was about. I, I'd never been exposed to a church like this before. Like I just was clueless. And I just remember thinking, if I'm going to do this, I've got to figure out what this means. And so I'm going to spend every waking moment that I can with, with Pastor Joe, because he seems to know what this means, right? And so I would go to youth group and after youth group, I would hang around until he left. I'd go to worship practice. I'd hang around until he left. Well, if you know Pastor Joe, he's a prankster, right? And if you know our other building in Warrington, it's a very large building. Well, one of the things he would task me with is turning the lights off. Now, normally that's not a big deal, but that building's creepy at 10 o'clock at night with no lights, all right? And then you add Pastor Joe in the mix. You know what, you guys know what he would be doing. He would be jumping out of every corner, scaring the heck out of me every week. Maybe that's, maybe that's, maybe I got some stuff I need to deal with in therapy. I don't know, but... All of that to say, you can be in the same room as somebody, but because it's pitch black darkness, you don't even know they're there. And you feel completely isolated. Nobody else knows what I'm going through. Nobody else has been what I've been through. But yet there could be somebody standing four feet away that is in the same spot that you are. Darkness has this, these tricks that it can play on us. But here's the good news. You've been lied to. Darkness isn't real. You just have to know how to overcome it. So how do you overcome it? Like I said, that was kind of my first point. I jumped ahead a little bit. But to overcome darkness, you have to understand, first off, that darkness isn't real. You can never create darkness. Look, I want you to think about whatever area of your life that you feel dark in. And as soon as I say those words, you're thinking about it right now. Those areas... In your life that you, that you feel dark, look, you just bring the light in, it will completely revolutionize what you're facing right now. Darkness is not real. It's, you, you cannot create it. You just have to remove light. John chapter 1, verse, uh, verse 1 through 5 says this. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him. And by the way, when it's talking about the word here, it's talking about Jesus. And nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created. And his life brought what? Brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and darkness can never extinguish it. Look at that last line. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. When you're reading the word like this, there can often be like two different meanings. I truly believe what it's talking about there is it's talking about what we read in Genesis where there was literal darkness and then light came and there we have Jesus and then we have light. But I also think that whatever other, not literal darkness, but darkness that you're facing in your heart and your mind or whatever that looks like, you bring Jesus into it, it has to go away. It has to go away. It, 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 in the same way that when you turn a light on, the darkness has to get expelled. That's the same thing that happens spiritually. So to overcome darkness, the first thing you have to understand is darkness isn't real. It's just the absence of the presence of Jesus. Second thing is this. To overcome darkness, you have to understand what the source of light comes from. John 8, chapter, uh, verse 12 says this. Jesus spoke again to the people saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, I don't, I don't want to mislead you here. It, there's a really interesting kind of concept when you start to study the Bible, how two what seem to be opposing things will be happening at the same time, right? So 
Often, like, for example, there's a parable Jesus talks about where, where he's talking about how weeds and good, good uh, plants will grow together. And at the end of the age, God will deal with them all. But there's two of them growing at the same time. Because the disciples were kind of like, no, we need to rip these weeds out. And God said, no, you'll damage the other one if you deal with the, with the weeds. So there, there's this kind of idea threaded throughout the whole Bible where there's good and bad happening at the same time. So I don't want you leaving here just thinking, well, if, if Jesus is the light, then that means that, that I, can flip, I can bring Jesus and then all my problems go away. No, that's not what happens. The Bible, I, I've talked about this before. Um, you know, a lot of times we love talking about the promises of God and all of the good things. You know what one promise of God is? You're going to walk through some dark valleys, right? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, can you finish it? I will fear no evil. We all know that scripture, but none of us are like in the middle of worship, like, yes, walk me through a dark valley. Like, but that's a promise that we're going to face, right? That's something that you are going to walk through darkness. I don't want, you, I don't want to have this misnomer today that, that, that you bring Jesus in and everything just vanishes, right? But it's better to walk through darkness with, the, with, the, with, with light than without, right? There was one time, uh, I was, it, it, I, one thing I really like to do is uh, walk late at night. I don't know why. Some people are early morning people and they like to pray and you know, because their day hasn't started. For me, I like to walk at night or, you know, kind of pray at night. And usually I, I'll walk my neighborhood or done this for years. And there was one night Xander wanted to go with me and it was like 1130 at night. I said, sure, you can go with me. So we're, we're walking and we're just, you know, talking, trying to kind of bond a little bit or whatever. And, and, um, and I said, and, and again, it's, it's later at night. And I just kind of wanted to drive this point home with her. And I said, Xander, do you think like right now, are you scared? And she said, no, why would I be scared? And I said, well, if I wasn't here, would you be scared? She's like, yeah, probably would be scared because it's 1130 at night and we're walking, you know, in the dark place by the gas station and stuff. Like, yeah, I'd probably be a little nervous. And I said, I want you to always remember that. that I can't always physically be with you, but your heavenly father always will be. So when you're walking through dark, dark times, you've got to know that you've got, a, you've got a heavenly father who loves you so much and is more of a perfect father than I am that's walking with you. And I, want, I just try to use that time as, as an example of that, right? That's the same for your life. You've got to know where the source of light is, though, and it's Jesus. I'm not trying to say that, if, if, that when you give your life to Jesus, all of your life is going to go perfect. Honestly, quite honestly, you become a bigger target on the en uh, for the enemy, and he's probably going to create some chaos in your life, to be quite frank with you. But it's worth it, right? A lot of times what we try to do is we face these dark areas, these dark times, and we try to, to go to the wrong sources of life. I'm sorry, of light. We try to go to, to you know, what it, for some of us it might be workaholic. For some of us it might be alcohol. It might be drugs. There's a, there's a million different things, that, good things or bad things, where we try to bring this light in, but all it does is just create more darkness, right? So you have to realize to overcome darkness the number one thing to understand is this. Jesus is the only source of life that will, will, will correct your darkness. That's it. Nothing else. Everything else might last for a moment, but eventually the batteries are going to go dead. And you're going to be right in the same spot that you were before in complete darkness, wondering, why is this not working? Well, it's because of this. John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. That's it. Nobody else. You know, the number one thing the enemy is going to try to get you to do is anything else other than Jesus. Anything else. If you, if, you're, if you can replace serving at goodwill and you think you're doing such a good thing, you know, a lot of times we try to frame this as like, it's always just the bad stuff, you know, all of those things. Is, you know, Satan can, can distract you with really good things too. He can get you feeding the homeless and, 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 and you know, whatever, and, and make you think that that's the light of life. Now, not, now, obviously, we should be doing that as Christians. I'm not saying we should, but we shouldn't do that apart from Jesus, right? What is it in your life that the enemy is going to try to distract you with and say, oh, use the, this, this will cure your darkness. This will cure your darkness. The only thing that will cure your darkness is Jesus. That's it. So to over, overcome darkness, the first thing you have to do is understand that darkness is not real. The second thing is you have to understand what the source of light is. And the third thing is this. To overcome darkness, you have to be close to the source. You have to be close to the source. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 says this. This is the message that we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. 
If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. I'm really confident today that as we're talking about darkness, you're thinking about these different areas in your life. Because there's there could be a you know a portion of your life that's going really well and it just feels like, man, the sun's shining, I'm getting a sunburn, everything's going so great, right? But then there's these other areas we don't talk about that are dark. You have to not only recognize that Jesus is it, but you have to submit yourself to that source. You have to stay close. Look, right now my phone is not on me because I don't want, you know, some notification to go off and that kind of stuff. And so I always like leave it in the sound booth or something, put it in airplane mode, whatever. But for most of us, our, if, if, if we're in a dark area of our life, what, what do we reach for first? We reach for our phone, right? Because it's got that awesome flashlight that's actually pretty bright now, right? If I'm not close to that source though, let's say all these lights go off and the sun goes out for some reason, just for the sake of the analogy, <laughs> we're, in, we're in utter darkness here. It doesn't matter if I understand that the source of my closest light is my phone, which is sitting in the sound booth, if it's not on my person. I've got to have it close to me. Can I also say this? I've got to have it close to me even whenever it's really bright out. Even whenever I have the light all around me. Because some of you in here might be saying like, man, I really don't have any dark area in my life. Like everything's going good. Well, let me, let me tell you, something's, <laughs> something's coming, right? There's going to be a point where you're going to need to have that, that deal. You're going to need to have that light. You're going to need to be close to that source. Look, if you just treat Jesus as when I have darkness, I'm going to pray and God, I need your help. And, I need, and, and Jesus will, will come in. He will help you in those times. But how be, have you guys ever had that friend that only calls you when they need something? It's like, oh, I, okay, what is it this time? Like, you know, those aren't like, you'll, you might take the call, but those aren't the funnest friends. <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't be that type of friend to Jesus. Don't be the person who's, I'm only going to reach out. I'm only going to try to find that, that light whenever everything feels really dark. But when everything, whenever he lights up the world and everything is all good and, you know, for me again, then I'm just going to kind of go and do my own thing. Look, you've, you've got to have that source of light on you consistently. You've got to develop. You've got to know how to use that thing. You've got you've to gotta almost, almost be trained with it in a sense, right? I, for a few years, um, I taught CCW classes. If you know what that is, it's, it's uh, used to in Missouri. You, have to, you, you would have to take a course to be able to uh, con, uh, conceal, uh, carry a concealed firearm. And um, did that for several years until they, they changed the law. And, and through that time, I was, I was um, talking to people, and I was doing a lot of research. And one of the things they noticed, you know, you would think like police officers, for example, who carry a firearm all the time. And I'm not saying all police officers with this, but there's a lot of times that they would stop their training, right? They would be really proficient whenever they started off. And then you would see them where they would just stop training. They wouldn't train for months or years sometimes. And then they, there, was, there was stuff coming out where they would then need their firearm and then wouldn't know how to use it, even though that they carried it on them all the time. So we, you've got to consistently train yourself over and over and over because even if you, whenever you first got saved and you first, you know, came into the church and everything was great and you just felt so on fire and you were reading your Bible every day and everything was great. If you did that 20 years ago, but you're not doing it now, how many of you know it's, it's, your skills can wane, right? Like I took my wife out on an amazing first date, I think, I don't remember it, but I'm sure it was amazing. That doesn't mean that it's going to translate to my marriage right now, right? What do I got to do? I got to keep going on dates all the time, like once a week. No, it's, it's great because that I, I, I say like uh, dates are cheaper than therapy. So uh, like Mexican food tastes great. Let's go. Like once a week, it's Lake St. Louis. That's where we're at usually on Tuesday. Anyway, I don't even know what I was talking about that, but relationship, here we go. Love my wife. She's back on the camera. Um, You've got to develop this. Look, when it comes to the source of light, we're talking about Jesus. Jesus is light. Jesus is also a relationship. It's not about religion. You guys all know that. You guys in here, you've been in church. You, you understand that. This is a relationship. How many of you guys know, like, last week your, your relationship with your wife or your husband can be going great, and this week, like, something comes up, and, you know, I put my clothes in the wrong spot or whatever, you know, like, 
You've got to work at it every week. Where are you at with the source of life? Like the literal source of life. Do you know how amazing it is that we, the number one reason Jesus came for us and died for us is, was because he wants to be your friend. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to guide you through this life. The God that created the heavens and the stars. Have you guys ever just gone on a dark night and just looked at space like, wow, I'm so small. The God that created all of that, his greatest possession that he cares about the most is you. He gave his life for you. At the end of the world, whenever the end of the world happens, the Bible says all of this is going to be destroyed and everything's going to be made new. Why? For us. You are his focus. You are the reason he wants, he, that, that he gave everything. He gave up even his, his, like, Jesus is still a human. It's not like he came down as a human and changed form for a little bit and then went back to heaven and went back to his, he is still a human. He sacrificed that for us. How amazing is that? And all we have to do, it doesn't matter about our works. It doesn't matter about anything else. All we have to do is just say, God, I surrender to you. What do you want to do with my life? I'm yours. And it's the best trip ever. Would you agree? Yes. To overcome darkness, you have to understand you've been lied to. Darkness isn't real. It's just the absence of something. You have to understand the source of light is Jesus. And you have to stay close to that source. I want to wrap up with this. Here's the good news. Whenever, whenever you don't have pastor... You get out right, almost, right about 10, so you're welcome. The food places don't even open till 11, so you all can hang out here, all right? I'm just kidding. Pastor doesn't normally go long, so I don't, don't think that he does. But some of you guys in here are thinking, you, Tony, you don't understand how dark my darkness is. Can I give you some hope? It can be pitch black. You can't see your hand in front of your face. When the smallest light comes on, you can see the whole place. I don't care how dark your life is. I don't care because it's not real. It's just the absence of light. So if you want that darkness removed, you've got hope today. You don't have to do anything. It doesn't matter about your works. It doesn't matter about none of that. It's just the only thing that matters is turn the light switch on and stay close to that forever. That's what you do. Let's pray. God, we just thank you, Lord, for today. Father, we are just so thankful God, we're just so thankful that you sent your son Jesus to die for us. God, that you want nothing more than to have a relationship with us, Father. God, we're so honored in that regard. God, we thank you for that. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, with every head bowed and every eye closed, it's the simplest thing to do. All you have to do is say, I just surrender my life completely to you. If you've never done that before and you'd like to, you can start that journey today. All you have to do is just pray this prayer. And this prayer isn't a magic prayer that gets you into heaven or anything like that. It's kind of like when you get married, there's a ceremony, but the marriage actually starts after the ceremony. That's what this prayer is. If you've never done that before and you'd like to, just repeat this after me. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me, for taking away my sins so you can have a relationship with me. From this point forward, I give you my entire life. I want to live for you. No matter what you say, no matter where you take me, in Jesus' name, amen. If you've never done that before, we've got a special gift. Stacia or I or somebody in here can grab for you. Got some cool stuff in there. Um, all right, amen. All right, we're going to receive tithes and offerings real quick. Ushers, you guys can come forward. Um, if you're making out a check, you make a payable to FCFC. We've also got text to give as well. You guys can go ahead and pass those down. A couple of things coming up. Um, we've got Easter coming up in like three or four weeks. And so we've got a lot of really cool stuff planned. If you go to the Warrenton campus, we're going to be doing basically the same thing we did last year. We're going to be doing a Friday night service, but, but the Friday night service is not a different type of service from Sunday. It's the same service, but we're just doing it with barbecue. So I would definitely recommend going there because the, the barbecue guys that come to the Friday night service, uh, they actually win like major competitions with their ribs and stuff. And they said too, if you want to learn from them, they literally get there at like six in the morning and start smoking the ribs and all of that stuff. And they're amazing. So uh, they said they would teach some guys if you guys just want to hang out with them all day. And so I would highly recommend that. But um, on Friday, we'll be doing 
uh, barbecue, we'll be having the shaved ice, all of the glow-in-the-dark egg hunts, we'll have the bounce houses, all that type of stuff. That'll be at the Warrington campus on Friday. And then Sunday will look pretty normal, but here we'll be doing some games and bounce house and egg hunts and stuff if you want to take part in that. Cool? Amen, guys. What's that? That is a good call. We also will need some help. We don't have a sign me up. I'm glad you said that. Um, we, we also will need some help running some of those games uh, for Wentzville. So if you would be interested in helping us with that, it's really simple, right after service. Um, and Wentzville is a great service to go to because you're out by like 1030 and you can hit, get over to all the other places that you're feasting at or whatever. And so come to Wentzville. Warrington's great, but Wentzville's, <laughs> Wentzville's awesome. I'm just kidding. Oh, I'm online too. Whoops. Well, whatever. <laughs> Warrington's great too. All right, let's all stand up. Hope you guys have a great Sunday. It's supposed to be some great weather this week. We'll let you guys out a little bit earlier. I hope that's all right. You guys are dismissed. We'll see you next week.